on to another Tuesday night group, 8 p.m. here, at least my time. I don't know what everyone else is joining as. So, um, let's see here. I think everything looks good. Still learning this process. <laughs> All right. All right, there's Gus. Thank you. Thank you, Gus, for confirming that somebody out there sees me. So, very good. <laughs> All right. Um, I tell you what, I want to start by pulling up, actually. Let me go ahead and flip. Remember to share my screen this time. Thanks, Jake. So, let's see here. We've got this pulled up. I want to share the ICND 2 blueprint to kind of give us an overview of where we are and how we're doing. Um, last week, we covered the spanning tree uh, protocols here. So 1.3 and 1.4. I wanted to split 1.0 up into two different sections just because spanning tree itself can take a lot of effort to, as we as we saw last week. Um, I did promise that I'd come back and explain max age, so I'm going to do that <laughs> first before we um, get into anything else. As far as the rest of the topics, there are some interesting ones in here. We do have things like VLANs and trunks, and if there's any specific conversations we need to have around that, I know DTP and VTP, you know, if I can say that, <laughs> dynamic trunking protocol and VLAN trunking protocol, um, those would uh, potentially generate some questions. And then also, um, looking down the list beyond spanning tree, we have ether channels down here. We have, um, looks like stacking and uh, chassis aggregation. That's kind of an interesting one. Uh, that's a little more real worldy than, you know, theoretical. So I might want to spend some time talking about that. And uh, 802.1x, um, security mechanisms, DHCP snooping. So it says describe common access layer threat mitigation techniques. So all that to say, I'm going to um, go ahead and dive into explaining spanning tree max age. But while I'm doing that, feel free to punch into the chat what exactly you're um, hoping to get out of this, and we'll um, <laughs> we'll just take it from there. Um, which topic? Let me be clear about that. Which topic makes the most sense to uh, to cover? So we want to meet you where you are. So let me go ahead and flip over to. It should be. There we go. Um, our whiteboard here. That is not the right color. Hold up, real quick. There we go, that'll work. I think my, uh, there we go. Yep, that'll do it. So, um, so max age. So I'm gonna give an example. I wanna walk through a scenario that's really going to help um, understand what max age is doing. Let me just check my, yeah, I thought so. One of my kids was in here actually uh, drawing on the screen. I think he messed with, oh geez, messed with some of the settings. There we go, <laughs> that's better. Okay, so I want to walk through this scenario because it'll, it'll really help drive home why we have a max age timer. So when we have, we talked last week about a three switch scenario here and we'll call it switch one, switch two, and switch three. And by the way, I have a lab pulled up where this is pulled together so we can actually look at some spanning tree commands after this, which will be pretty fun, I think. Um, here's our three switch topology. And remember we talked about last time, we're just... a we're gonna say that switch one is the root. We remember which one is a higher or lower priority. We talked about if you're lower on the OSI model, it usually means that the lower number is the higher priority, which <laughs> can be backwards um, in our heads at least. Highest priority or lowest priority is better priority. Um, can be can be rather confusing. So the fact that we have, um, let me see here, the switch one, switch two, and switch three, if we were to say, all right, let's assume that every switch's primary MAC address ends with its number. So switch one is going to end with a zero one, switch two will end with a zero two, and switch three will end with a zero three. If all of the other digits within the MAC addresses are the same, then the tiebreaker says in spanning tree that the lower number wins from a root perspective. So we know switch one is the root. That means that, change colors here, that switch two is going to set a root port and switch three is going to set a root port. That root port points towards switch one and it's where I expect to receive BPDUs. So I should only receive BPDUs on root ports and blocking ports. And so we'll get to the blocking port in a minute, but I'm sending BPDUs down my designated ports. So then the question of course, 
um, is, well, back up to switch one real quick. Switch one declares its ports are both designating because on the root, all ports are designating. The root doesn't block anything. And because it is the root, it can't have a root port because the root port points to the root and the root is itself. Now, if you did loop a cable, I suppose, then you'd have to have a, a blocking port, <laughs> but we'd, we'd uh, that would be a different situation. All right, um, corner cases aside, what's happening down here between switches two and three? Remember we talked about how those BPDUs are getting sent down and then switch two is going to send that BPDU at switch three and switch three is going to send that BPDU at switch two. And we do remember that, remember we talked about just throwing boulders at each other, throwing rocks. And the bigger rock is gonna cream the smaller rock. And so, you know, in theory, if switch two is throwing the superior BPDU, it's going to ignore an inferior BPDU coming from switch three. And so we wanna look first of all at making sure we're talking about the same root switch. If switch three is still saying I'm the root, well, switch two is going to have an inferior BPDU. I'm sorry, it's gonna have a superior BPDU because it knows what the real root is um, and that'll win. But then switch two and switch three, now they both see the same root. Who is closer to the root? And with spanning tree, we didn't talk about cost last time, but there's always a cost to all links. And in the world of spanning tree, a hundred, let's say there's a hundred meg link, hundred meg, that's going to be 19 if we're using default spanning tree costs. And it's kind of a silly thing how we land at 19, but that's, that's just where we are. So um, if it's a hundred meg over here, regardless of what the cost is, unless we change the cost, which we can do with configuration changes, um, that cost will be the same. Okay, so switch two and switch three both say, I've got the same route, we have the same cost. So now we're going to compare each other's um, bridge IDs. And the bridge IDs are again, based on these numbers here, zero two and zero three. So if zero two and zero three are compared, zero three is the higher number, again, lower priority wins. So switch two wins the priority war because it's actually lower. Because switch two wins, it places this port into designated. I didn't match the colors there. That's important. So, oh, and I didn't write the right thing. There we go, designated port, which again, designated port means I send my BP to use. Switch three, on the other hand, this is where it's going to place this port into a blocking state. So we can erase this arrow we're no longer sending BPDUs. I usually like to draw like a vertical line to show that it's blocking rather than an X for whatever reason. Um, and so switch two continues to send its BPDU. So this is steady state operation. Switch one is sending its BPDUs down to both switches. Switch two is sending its BPDU over to switch three. And as long as nothing changes and nothing goes down, life is going to be very good. Max age, so let's go ahead and resolve this. Max age comes down to this. It's, it has to do usually with what we call an indirect link failure, okay? Direct link failure would be, let's, let's say this link goes down here. So this link, maybe I'll even make it a bolder red. Bad, that link just went down, okay? So switch two understands that that link just went down, it just lost its root port. When a root port goes down, I have no way of knowing if I have connection to the root. And because I'm not receiving BPDUs, remember, we're not actually sending BPDUs from switch three, it's not happening. I'm not sending anything, so I'm not receiving anything, so I am the root again. And I'm going to send now a bad, I guess I'll leave it as red, because it's actually bad. So this is no longer happening we're actually sending a bad BPDU saying, hey, I'm the root. Yeah, it's because I'm claiming to be the root again. Um, the sw switch two can make sure, or I can transition into that be immediately because it's a direct link failure. Because the root port went down, I know that I have no access to the root and I know I'm not getting BPDUs from anywhere else, so I can act on that. The question is, what about switch three? Because switch three, from switch three's perspective, this is what we call an indirect link failure. It did not actually fail on switch three. Because it didn't fail on switch three, it needs to understand, you know, it can't make an assumption. 
nothing went down that I can immediately react to, something else in the network changed. And the reason Switch 3 knows something in the network changed is because of this right here. Because Switch 2 is all of a sudden sending BPDUs to Switch 3 um, that are different, sorry. So this is where the max age timer comes into play. Because Switch 3, remember we talked about last time how there could be a hub out here and who knows what's hanging off of that hub. Just because we're receiving a new BPDU does not necessarily mean that I want to change out of a blocking state, okay? I might continue, I might get a bad BPDU, like if I connect a switch here and now they're all connected via a hub, all of a sudden I could get an inferior BPDU from switch four and yet switch two is up and life is good. And so if I immediately say, hey, something's up, I'm gonna pull out of the blocking state, that's not good for anybody. So we need to give it time. Say, okay, well, wait a second here. It might take a while for me to receive the next BPDU. And we wanna show grace in case. It's one thing to say that, okay, well, I waited two seconds and I still didn't get a BPDU forwarded from switch one. But hey, maybe, maybe switch two happened to drop that packet. And so we, we, we show a lot of grace. This is where the max age timer comes in. By default, the max age timer is calculated like this. A spanning tree environment, all of the timers are tuned, assuming a seven switch, what we call diameter. That means that if I go from the root switch all the way out to the furthest switch, there can be no more than seven switches in that path. So because of that, I want to make sure that I understand that it might take up to two seconds per hop in order for me to get a BPDU. Now, it should be more often than that, but we're going to just throw that out there and say seven times two seconds is 14 seconds. We also wanna show grace in case any one of those BPDUs gets dropped. In fact, we wanna show grace for up to three. That's the rule of threes in networking, right? We always wanna wait and make sure that three of anything can get dropped and we're still fine, or at least on the third one is when we, we care. And so because BPDUs come again in two second intervals, we add three times two, which is another six seconds. So this right here comes out to 20 seconds. Now, if our network is smaller, this is where we can go in and tune those STP timers. In this network, our diameter is three switches. So we can immediately say, okay, well, three times two plus three times two, six plus six, I could drop that max age to 20, or I'm sorry, to 12 seconds, and everything would be great. Okay, but this is where we need to be very intentional with those spanning tree timers, because if I just go in there and say, I want it to converge faster, and I'm gonna set my max age timer to 10 seconds. Well, there's a reason, again, why it's 20 seconds. Is it likely to cause problems? No, but is there a scenario that exists that could cause major havoc on your network? Absolutely there is. And yes, it would involve a BPDU getting dropped or maybe two BPDUs getting dropped. But if I just crank my timers down thinking it's going to speed up convergence, I'm, I'm in, I might be making a bad assumption there. So we need to be very careful about that. Okay, so what max age does, now that we understand where it's, how it's calculated, here's how it behaves. Here, how, here's how switch three behaves. I'm gonna turn off my glaringly dangerous looking red. How about some yellow? There we go. <laughs> a little more peaceful. All right, so again, indirect link failure over here. This link went down between switches one and two. Switch two changes its BPDU. So switch three right here is all of a sudden receiving a new BPDU type that's inferior to what it was receiving. So if I receive anything that's of an inferior BPDU, I'm going to ignore it. I'm going to ignore anything other than unless something comes that's better. If something comes that's better, I need to listen to that. Um, but if it's better or equal to, we're good. And every time I receive that BPU, I reset max age. So if I count down 20, 19, 18, oh, just got a BPU, back up to 20. 19, 18, oh, just got a BPU. And that's how life is going to progress for the most part. It's gonna start at 20 seconds, count down two seconds, get that BPU, and we're good. Um, but again, in the scenario where that indirect link failed, we know we're never going to get that BPU back. 
because switch one has no way of sending that BPDU down to switch two in order to get it propagated over to switch three. And because of that, um, we are going to wait. We know we're going to have to wait all 20 seconds for it to realize, oh, okay, I haven't received anything in 20 seconds. And here's, call it the bad news, I suppose. Um, we're, we're not just flipping the switch and saying, okay, we're up in 20 seconds. We're going to reset completely at that point. So after the 20 seconds, after we've ignored all of the BP, the inferior BPDs that's come out, we're going to go right into listening. And if you remember that forward delay timer, that 15 seconds applies to two states. It applies to listening and it applies to learning. So let's do some math here. I just waited 20 seconds. Then I go into 15 seconds of listening. And then I do 15 seconds of learning, which is exactly like listening in both situations. We're sending BPDUs, but learning, we're actually learning MAC addresses at that point. Um, 20 plus 15 plus 15, that's 50 seconds. Now, I had always heard 50 seconds. In fact, I told the story last time that when I sat down to start studying for the CCIE, I was like, oh, okay, I know how this works. Yeah, it was CCIE. I was a CCNP at that point, sitting down to study for the CCIE. And I got three switches on my desk and arranged them exactly like we have in this drawing. And I was like, okay, it's gonna take 50 seconds for this port to come up. Boom, start the timer. And at 30 seconds, it came up. And I was baffled. Like, I thought it was 50 seconds. Well, it's 30 seconds to come up because of listening and learning. When max age is at play and we have an indirect link failure, we need to wait 20 seconds to be like, okay, something changed. Then we do listening and learning and that's where the 50 seconds comes from. So hopefully that's clear on what max age is. If you have any questions at all, feel free to toss it into the chat. Um, for those, anybody who's joined since the very start, by the way, um, we are going through spanning tree right now talking about the max age timer. And if I pull this up, there we go. Here's what I wanna to cover tonight, um, all of the various topics that we could cover. And so we're, we've got DTP, VTP, we already covered, covered STP. Feels like we've got something going on here with the TPs. STP, DPT, DT, I can't even say them. <laughs> STP, DTP, VTP. That, um, that, that should be a, a test question at some point. Like, raise your hand and tell the proctor of these acronyms. Um, everyone would fail. So we've got ether channels. We have, again, this one that I think is pretty interesting, switch stacking and chassis aggregation. And then um, security, which is also pretty pretty a uh, good topic. I um, feel like I missed one. No, I think that's it. Um, we already covered spanning tree in theory. But any questions about spanning tree or fair game today? So if you got anything, let us know. Okay. Any questions? I see. Good. All right. Good. Good. So nothing coming in about spanning tree at this point. I think we are good. Um, yeah, I don't think we need to keep going through this scenario. Um, once we go to listening and learning, everything will open back up and life life should be good. So um, what it comes down to more often than not is that if there's an indirect link failure, all of a sudden we're going to have to unblock a port that was blocked. And if we think about that, that's dangerous. We were blocking that port for a reason. So the trigger in, in your mind for anything happening like this should be that, um, hey, a, um, if I'm gonna switch from a blocking to a non-blocking state, something, something's gotta change, okay? So, all right, that said, let's go ahead and move on to the new topic. Okay, so, um, since I haven't seen anybody chime in to the chat saying they've got anything, let me pull up and talk about one. Th let's see here. Let's talk about let's talk about ether channels, static PAGP and LACP. This is going to be important for us to understand. Okay, so ether channels. I, I mentioned this last time, and I I believe this with my whole heart. We built networks on Ethernet. And Ethernet is so terrible of a protocol that we've spent the last 30 years just trying to fix all of the problems of Ethernet. And this is one of the this is one of the ways we do that. 
So ether or uh, spanning tree was invented because we remember we talked about how if we have these three switches and if a broadcast goes out, it's going to live forever because it's simply going to get sent around and around and around. And that's all well and good until I have 100,000 of these packets floating around in my network and this is what we call a broadcast storm. And so spanning tree says, okay, wait a second here. Let's block this port. And now when a broadcast gets sent out, broadcast, broadcast, and yes, it does get sent down, but it's blocked at this layer at this point. So adjust my chair. Um, so this is, this is one way we had to fix ethernet was with spanning tree protocol. So this is all well and good, except let's drop bigger. If I have two switches, Hey, at least I only have two switches. It's impossible for me to create a loop, right? Because I just connect the two switches and then, well, wait a second. If I connect those two switches again, I have a loop because if my broadcast gets sent out towards one switch, it's simply going to loop back around to the second switch, which will get forwarded back to the first, which will get forwarded back to the second. And we have a loop. In fact, if you've, <laughs> Challenge accepted, right? Can we make a loop on a single switch? And the answer is absolutely yes, because I can take a single switch and I can cable two ports together. I've created a loop. So no matter what the scenario is, I can have loops in my network. And spanning tree fixes all of these because in the, for the same reason we talked about, I can block this interface, preventing this horrible loop that I've created on a single switch. And I can block one of these. But just like we talked about last time with per VLAN spanning tree, Cisco's solution to try to rectify the fact that we're blocking links. Again, imagine that these are 100 gig links in your data center. Does this solution work? Absolutely. I have saved my data center network with spanning tree. Who wants to be the one to tell the boss that these $10,000 transceivers that we bought are sitting there idle because of spanning tree? I mean, I no one no one's gonna raise their hands. And by the way, ten thousand dollars is a pretty good deal on some of those. So <laughs> um, that there's a uh, the, we we hopefully understand that it's not ideal, nor is it prudent from a cost perspective to be blocking these very expensive links. And yes, today it's I, I say a hundred gig with intention because most of us aren't dealing with a hundred gig interfaces. But this is how it felt when we were using spanning tree to block. 100 meg interfaces, because even though it was only 100 meg, 100 meg 20 years ago, it was a significant amount of bandwidth, and we did not want to have to block those 100 meg ports. So what's the solution? Well, this is where ether channels come in. If I, instead of, here, I'll erase my block port. I guess I should fill that back in. There we go. All right. So one of the ways that we can fix spanning tree, I'm sorry, fix ethernet <laughs> without blocking one of these links is to bundle them together, okay? What that means, there's a lot of magic, by the way, that has to happen underneath the hood to make this happen. Um, in today's modern networking, we've been ether channeling for so long that it just feels like, oh yeah, you bundle them together. It's one logical link, but um, there's a lot that has to happen underneath, underneath the hood to make this happen. So what's, what's really happening here is that as traffic comes in, this switch is going to load balance that traffic across those two links. And the switch on the other side is going to receive all of that traffic from those two links and treat it as if it arrived on the same layer two link. Okay, so what that ultimately means is this. If I get a broadcast packet coming in, because this is the scenario we care about, and a broadcast packet has to be forwarded out all links, how many copies of that broadcast get forwarded out those two links? Fortunately, in this scenario, one. The reason why it's only one is because we've bundled that together and turned it into a single logical layer two link. Now, as that link, or as that um, physically, as that packet physically gets mapped to an interface, we understand there's still two interfaces there. In fact, we can bundle up to eight interfaces together and in most on most switches. You can actually bundle 16 in some cases, but in a lot of those cases, eight of them are active and eight of them are kind of like 
uh, call it backups, I guess. Um, and so because of that, we're going to send that packet out one of those physical interfaces. It's going to be load balanced in some fashion out one of those physical interfaces and it's going to be received out that physical interface or inside or yeah, received on that physical interface. And because again, this switch views it on the right as a single logical link, it's not going to pull it in and send it back out. That would be a, a loop and that would be bad. Instead, we're going to say, Hey, I've received it. I'm going to send it out all of the other ports, but this physical interface right here is part of the other one. It's bundled together. So this prevents loops and I've just created a 200 gig link. So I can go back to my boss and say, Hey, guess what? I solved that problem. That $20,000 that we were wasting is now good. I just want 5% of that as a, you know, as a bonus and my holiday you know, Christmas bonus or something. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that one. Okay. So we've got a question that came in. Can you configure the logical links at the same time? So Nate, I um, give me a little context on that. I think can you configure the logical links at the same time. Um, are you asking about like, like an interface range command, like get onto the interface range onto both of those and configure them at the same time. Um, can you give an example as how is encoded from OBS to Twitch and then to the end user? Oh, um, I don't think that quite, not exactly sure what that, what, what you're saying there either. You're talking about like an end to end network, like a packet flow, um, like cats. You're talking about like an end to end network flow. You want to understand how the packets flow from through the network and get out to Twitch packet flow. Okay, cool. Yeah. I'll get to that in a moment. So Nate, once they are bundled together, do you need to make configurations in all physical links separately? Can you do a single config command? Ah, 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 okay, thank you, that helps. Okay, so once we have configured the links within Cisco, within the world of Cisco, right? Which is, you know, <laughs> I wanna make sure that's on the camera. We're talking Cisco tonight. Um, within the world of Cisco, um, yes, we get what we call like an interface, um, a port channel interface. Um, and so interface port channel, port dash channel, um, 10 or what have you, which is the, the, uh, the Nexus version of that. So it would also be, um, interface ether channel, right? It's been so long since I've played on iOS ether channel. So, um, is it, is it interface? Is it, is that the global once it's. Hold up real quick. We're going to pull up, oh, lovely, my um, my sessions died here. All right, so we do have a couple of switches pulled up here. So if I were to, let's say do interface, let me do a quick show, do show IP int brief. All right, so interface range gig zero slash zero to gig zero slash one. Let's try that. Oops, don't need that. There we go. All right, so we use the channel group command, channel group 10 in mode, and we're gonna talk about this mode here. You guys are seeing this all right? It looks like it, all right, good. So just say mode on. Okay, it is port channel. I definitely um, doubted myself there because I spend so much of my time on Nexus switches. And port channel 10, okay, good. So, all right, so interestingly, by the way, I know the uh, command is do show ether channel, right? And then summary, let's see if I can get that out. Yeah, so show ether channel and yet the interface is port channel. So ether channel is a Cisco word and port channel is an industry standard word, by the way. So um, this is where on, on a Nexus switch, they got rid of show ether channel and now it's show port channel. So we don't even use the word ether, ether channel on Nexus. But on iOS, it's a little bit of both. Interesting that you even see port channel there, even though the command I used was show ether channel. Okay, so um, where was I going with this? Nate's question. So good, if we wanna make a, a, a configuration change, most configuration changes are going to be blocked at the, at the um, interface layer. So if I go to interface gig zero slash zero, and I say, you know what? I'm gonna put you in switch access VLAN 100, um, right there. 
So cannot bundle, it's not compatible and will be suspended. Actually, did it accept it and it pulled it out? That's not what I was expecting to have happen. Oh, that's exactly what happened. So it pulled it out. It's not compatible anymore. So we've made it so it's not, I said show run int port channel 10. Okay. But if I get onto interface port channel 10 and I do switch access VLAN 100, is that what I did? I did 100, right? Yep, 100. Okay. All right. So, yeah, this is interesting because gig zero slash one. I will tell you this. My, oh, yeah, there, no, it did push it down. Okay. That's what I thought. I don't know why it's giving me the error messages. Because it said that it was going to be, oh, it's compatible. I misread that. Ah, how about that? So now that's compatible again. But you see what happened there? Let me go back in time here for a moment. So when I got on to do show run in port channel 10. So when I put this command on the port channel interface, it pushed that configuration down to the individual interfaces. Ignore this native VLAN issue. That's just because the other side of the connection is still configured for VLAN one. When I configured the individual gig zero slash zero, I believe I started with, as soon as I put that into VLAN 100, it didn't actually um, reject it. That's what, that's what I was thinking was going to happen. Um, some commands it will reject, um, but in this case, it actually took it and then complained that, it, hey, by the way, it's no longer compatible with the port channel config, so we're going to pull it out of that ether channel. So it pulled that out of the ether channel until I put that command on the port channel interface, putting it on the port channel interface, pushed it down to really technically both interfaces. And at that point it was compatible and it was part of the bundle again. Okay. So that is one that you would absolutely want to just kind of play around with in a lab switch to be like, Hey, what if I do this? And what if I do that? Because those are great, like thinking scenarios like, Oh, what if we do this? Um, and because we don't get to play around with these on live production gear very often. Uh, <laughs> and I wouldn't recommend you do it on live interfaces the uh that that you'll get a lot of uh, questions answered by doing just fun things i mean honestly one of the best ways to lab is just try to break things as much as you can You're like what if i do this does it break it oh it does and now i understand why so there we go so yes all that to say let me um flip back here so when i created this bundle right here let me do it like this I'll just erase some of these arrows. When I created this bundle, it created an interface port channel, whatever number we called it, 10 on this side. And it created one on this side. Well, it would have if I had done it. I didn't do it on that side. So interface port channel 10, interface port channel 10. I should do all of my configuration on that port channel interface moving forward. Okay, the, the, we just saw why. If I put a bad, bad command onto one of those interfaces, then um, yeah, it's gonna pull it out of the bundle. Now there are some commands that I have to put onto that physical interface. Um, anything that has to do with like, you know, UDLD comes to mind, a, a you know, something that is link specific. Um, speed, for example, well, you shouldn't even say that because you can't bundle ports that are different speeds. Um, but descriptions, interface description, like you, you can have a description on the port channel interface and you can have individual descriptions on those, um, member interfaces. Okay. So interface port channel 10. So we are going to talk about, oh, right. The protocols. So you notice when I configured that port channel, I said channel group 10 mode on that mode on meant something that was significant. Um, what that meant was I am, I have bundled these together from this switch's perspective. So remember what I talked about how it's going to receive traffic, anything destined for that, it's just going to load balance. Um, that also means by the way, that when I learn Mac addresses, I don't learn Mac addresses on individual links anymore. I learn it out that bundled interface, that port channel 10. And so it's behaving as if those ports are bundled. 
have I configured the other side yet? No, I have not configured the other side. Is that going to cause problems? You bet it's going to cause problems. <laughs> Uh, if one side of the link thinks it's bundled and the other side does not, well, we just talked about it. What happens when I get a broadcast and I send it out one of those two links? Well, it's going to receive it and it's going to do what a switch does and it's going to loop it back around because it's not bundled at this point from its perspective. So we have three different ways of activating port channels, one of which is what I did, mode on. It's what we call static. So if we look at that blueprint, Cisco mentioned those three different models. Let me just pull it up again. So we have static, PAGP, port aggregation protocol, and LACP, the link aggregation control protocol. So as you can imagine, uh, what happens a lot is that Cisco comes out, we mentioned this last time, Cisco comes out with something cool and then the industry wants to catch up. So Cisco came out with a protocol the port aggregation protocol, PAGP. Usually, I don't think it was spelled like I usually see it spelled. Let me see. Yeah, it's all caps here. Um, typically, it's going to be spelled port aggregation with a little g, A-G, because it's one word, I guess. Port aggregation protocol. You'll see it spelled like that a lot. What this is intending to do is to be a fail safe. When I say fail safe, I mean prevent dumb mistakes. <laughs> because if I as a network engineer just went on, switch on the left, added those two links, and now they're port channeled? And the other side isn't yet? We're going to have problems. We're going to have loops. We're going to have broadcast storms. We're going to have all kinds of issues. And so what if instead I got onto this, these links here, so these two links, and I said, hey, I want you to try to form a port channel. Yes, you're gonna try to form it on port channel 10. Yes, I'm creating this interface port channel 10, but those links will not become part of that bundle until it's negotiated that with the other switch. So I told it to try to become a bundle. I haven't done anything to the other side yet. So even though it's trying to become a bundle, the other side isn't having anything to do with that. Well, then I get onto this switch and I configure PAGP on that side. Now, both sides are reaching out to try to form that bundle. And hey, we figured it out. We've established connection. We are bundled up and we're good to go. And can also incidentally um, save problems later too, because if you imagine the same situation could happen in reverse where I pull one of the links out of the, uh, the bundle. And so the other side, because PAGP continues to run, will say, oh, ooh, um, you, you're not part of the bundle anymore, so I'm going to pull you out of the bundle. And again, we'll prevent problems and loops. All right, so Cisco came out with PAGP. It was a really cool idea. The rest of the industry said, hey, we want that too, and came out with that link aggregation control protocol, LACP. So LACP, for the most part, is what to use today. Um, I would not use PAGP over LACP. It doesn't have any advantages. And um, the other thing too is, again, we keep mentioning Nexus switches because I'm a data center guy. I have to. And Nexus switches will not run old Cisco protocols. And PAGP is an old Cisco protocol. So you will not find PAGP on Cisco Nexus switches. Um, because iOS is a Swiss army knife, Cisco wants it to be a Swiss army knife. Um, they've got everything under the sun in there and they don't pull anything out because the last thing they want is for you or I to replace a core switch that's running PAGP and uh, we, we can't actually make it work, which I don't know. I say that, but they also just got rid of ISL, which is their old switching protocol. So um, I'm sure that caused a little bit of headache in some somewhere, somewhere that's still running ISL instead of .1Q. I have no idea where. But um, so we might see PAGP pulled out of kettle switches one day. We'll find out. All right. So that is static PAGP and LACP. Now, quick question. How do we configure those? Let me pull up something. Switch. There we go. So how do I configure those? 
And let's go back to that interface range command. And that command I ran, channel dash group. Again, why Cisco didn't make the command port channel or ether channel or something? It's channel group. I have no idea, but that's our command. Channel group 10, that's the number that we're going to call it. Mode. And then here's our options. And these are interesting because if you just look at that list, what in the world? We've got active, auto, desirable, and passive. Um, yeah. So let's just break this down pretty simply. There are two states that are LACP, and we see them here, active and passive. Those are pretty easy to understand, active and passive. If I told you that um, we had an LACP, I'm, I'm trying to build an LACP connection, and I put one side on active, and the other side on passive, you'd probably, you know, okay, well, it's actively trying to make a connection this way and therefore it's successful and that, that would be correct. So here's, here's the, it's one of these binary math issues, you know, like an and operation or an or operation. So if I have active and active, they're gonna form a link. If I have active and passive, they're gonna form a link. If I have passive and active, they're gonna form a link. Now, it sounds like we're forming the link the other way, but and in a way I am, but at the end of the day, the link is the link. So either way, I form a link. What if I have passive and passive? They're not going to form a link. They're not going to be added to the bundle. It's the only situation where a link is not formed is if I have passive and passive. A very, I would consider a pretty odd um I mean, like they're trying to solve a problem, I guess. It's 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 an odd way of doing it. It really is. I don't have a good reason for it. I don't think we have a super strong reason for it. Uh, but that's the way it is. And PAGP, now we look and we see, oh, we've got two other words in here, auto and desirable. And those would be tied to PAGP. Those are a lot less intuitive. Um, but I'll tell you this. Here's the good news. Desirable, same thing as active. Auto, same thing as passive. In fact, if we look at the description, enable PAGP, PAGP only if a PAGP device is detected. Well, match that up with passive. Enable LACP only if an LACP device is detected. It's literally this, like other than PAGP and LACP, it's word for word identical. Same with active, enabled unconditionally and desirable. So if I wanted to enable PAGP, I'm gonna have the same situation. I'm going to have, if I have desirable, desirable, forms a link. Auto desirable forms a link. Desirable auto forms a link. Auto and auto, no, does not form a link, which seems counterintuitive to say I've just configured them for auto. Auto automatically form a link? Mm -mm, not how it works. So auto is passive, desirable is active. So those are how, that's how I configure an LACP link. Um, Nate, great question. Is there a reason not to have active and active? This is, <laughs> I would say no. Um, I like to configure both sides for active. Um, I'm trying to think if I can invent a scenario where it wouldn't be a good idea. Like I think when they came up with this way of doing it, their thought was, um, okay, I will like my, my core switch will be the active side and the downstream switches will be passive. And that way, if I accidentally connect two passive switches to each other to, let me go back to the whiteboard. Um, so it would be protection. If, if I said I've got a core switch and I've got three switches down here and I put active, if I put active up here and active down here, like at the two different layers. So all, all six of these are active and all six of those are active. The danger would be what if I link like those two guys by accident? Well, now I'm establishing a relationship with, now it won't be added to the same bundle because it's gonna be a different switch trying to do the negotiations and LACP and PAGP are smart and they figure that out. But could I form a different port channel? Sure, and maybe I didn't want that. So if I, you know, somehow made them passive, then at least they're not forming an ether channel. But even then, like, why not form the ether channel? So 
Um, I couldn't even invent a reason to make them not active. So um, I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say no, based on your wording of your question. Is there a reason not to have active and active? I'm going to say no, there's no reason to. Not that I can come up with. Um, and most places that I have seen will um, will just configure active on both sides. The weirdest thing about all of that is that if you're going to configure LACP, you never really use the LACP word in the configuration. Um, same with PAGP. You're not you're not saying I'm going to use LACP. You're going to say channel group mode active, and we're supposed to know that active is LACP. And yes, we are. Cisco will ask us that. That um, is very likely to be a CCNA question, just because, like, I think it'd be a great question. To be like, okay, hey, what are you going to do to configure LACP? And what's the command? Is it channel group mode on, channel group mode active, channel group mode desirable, channel group mode LACP? And you're going to sit there and anybody who doesn't know is going to be like LACP. And if you don't know, or if you're like, oh, I know it's not on and I know it's not LACP, but now you have to choose between active and desirable. Um, so anyways, so definitely memorize that and be ready in case they ask that on the CCNA. Okay, whew. So I think that's it for Ether Channel. Let's double check the blueprint. We talked about PAGP, we talked about LACP. We briefly mentioned static again, that is that mode on. If it's mode on, it's considered a static configuration. So let's, um, yeah, there's, there's not much else to say to that other than if you're going to use mode on, be very careful because you need to make sure that it's configured on the other side. So best practice is not to use static and yet it's something that a lot of people do. So <laughs> try to, try to, you know, if you've got a live network that's full of m static ether channels, don't worry about it. I mean, at some point, if you're going to do a network cleanup on a switch, you're going to take a link down, sure, convert it to LACP, but it's, it doesn't have to be a top priority to convert everything to LACP. You're going to cause more outages fixing it than you ever would have experienced um, leaving it alone. So, um, but yeah, I mean, migrate to LACP eventually and start using LACP for new connections. All right. Um... I'm going to move to 1.6 unless we have further questions. I don't see any come in, but um, everything's fair game. Again, ask Spanish tree questions, ether channel questions. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this concept of switch stacking and chassis. So the reason that I want to do that is because it changes the way we design networks. And this is a little bit higher level thinking uh, from the, the certification perspective. CCNAs aren't always, aren't often tasked with designing networks. But at the same time, you wanna start thinking along those lines. Because if you're not in a place yet where your career in your career where you are designing networks, you might end up there one day. And honestly, as somebody who designs a lot of networks or did design a lot of networks, I, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to design a network. Um, so I want you to start thinking like a designer and start thinking about these things as you learn these concepts of, um, in fact, Nate, that was a great question. That's a design level question of like, huh, how would I design this? Would I put active on both sides? Is there any reason not to, any gotchas, right? And that's a design level question. That's a great question. So um, all of, and the reason, as much as anything, I want to, um, I want to talk about this topic is because I keep talking about how Ethernet is a really bad protocol and everything we do is to fix Ethernet. And this is another reason, this is another one, okay? Because I'm gonna walk you through a scenario. Here's how life used to be. We had some kind of core or maybe a distribution layer switch. And then we had a network closet. And in that network closet, we have need the need for, let's say 200 users are hanging off of that. That would be phones, access points, printers, PCs, laptops, everything. We've got 200 users hanging off of this closet. So how many switches do I need? Well, I'm back in the day, 24 port switches. I mean, now we're, we're at least talking about 
Well, 24 times 10 is 240 minus 48, so 192. So I guess that's eight switches. Um, hey, 48 port switches would get me, technically that, that even falls short because eight takes me down just below 200. So now I need four, four 48 port switches, five 48 port switches. Let's say I have five switches. One, two, three, four, five. Five switches. So again, put your designing hat on. How are we going to connect these switches back to the distribution uh, switch? I can tell you that, as my phone explodes, I don't know what's going on there. Um, I can tell you that the best thing to do is this. Connection, 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 connection. Why is that the best option? Well, because, do you see any loops? No, nope, no spanning tree to worry about there. Um, how many hops does each switch have to get back to the distribution switch? One. This is the best solution. What's the problem with this solution? Why wouldn't we just do this? Because that's fiber in most cases. Uh, and fiber is expensive. And you're going to go to your boss and say, hey, I need those $10,000 optics. I need 10 of those. Okay, so... In a closet, you're usually not dealing with $10,000 optics. That's usually in data centers. But um, regardless, you're asking for roughly, well, let's see here. If I need, if I were to say two connections to this closet, I need four optics. If I'm going to say five connections to this closet, I need 10 optics. So I just increased my need by two and a half times. So I'm asking for two and a half times as much money to get this job done. And I, right when I say put your network thinking cap on, it's going to come coupled with a big warning, which is that the driving force behind almost every network design is the almighty dollar or euro or wherever you are. The, the cost of the solution has to be a, con a conversation, okay? If we all had infinite money, we'd all deploy... Cisco Catalyst 6800s or the Catalyst new 9500s in every single closet. And we obviously can't do that. We have to take cost into account. And so we wanna find the most optimal design that gets the job done that doesn't break the bank. It's always a factor. So from here, where do we go? Well, this solution isn't going to work. So we need two connections. For redundancy, or we could probably convince our bosses of that. Maybe not. If not, we get one connection. Boss is like, uh, can we get away with one? Because that's all we got budget for. Yeah, we can. And then we're going to daisy chain down. In most cases. Um, technically, technically what we could do, there's another option, is we could hang all of these switches off of one switch. What's the problem with this design? If that switch dies, then we just lost the whole closet. So that's problematic. So realistically, what we're going to do is this. And if we're lucky enough to get that second connection back to the distribution layer, now I get my redundancy. And I connect it like this. And what are the downsides to this? Well, the downside is there's a loop. So we're going to have a blocking port probably right in there somewhere. And also, how many hops away are they? Well, if I've got a mission critical server. I don't know why I have a mission critical server hanging off of this closet. Let's just say it's a, we're in a medical clinic and an important doctor's PC hangs off of this switch. Well, he's going to have to hop here and here and here. So that's three hops to get through the network from that PC. All right. I have zero users. What's the best solution? <laughs> oh, um, Wow, well, your best solution. You have the most secure network on the planet if you have zero users. So congratulations. Um, just unplug the switches and you are golden. So um, that is that is phenomenal. All right. Unless uh, now, if that if that was a typo or I totally misread that, then uh, feel free to offer clarification. But I was taking that as a as a as a uh, a wisecrack saying I have zero users. Okay. So. Um, Let's see here, pattern uh, interrupt, I lost my train of thought. So we've designed this network now and yeah, it's it's not super ideal. But at the same time, it gets the job done. 
it, it, it saves me money. Again, I might not even have, whoops, I might not even have this link. Maybe I'm lucky enough to have it, maybe I'm not, but at least everybody's connected and they're probably connected about the best way possible. But again, because ethernet is unfortunate, <laughs> for lack of better words, and we're blocking links and all we got all these hops, it's just not ideal. No matter what we do, it's not ideal. And that's just kind of the reality. <laughs> it was a joke, all right, very good. Not really, because I wish I had users. Uh, I'd love to know uh, what kind of network has no users, but well, you know, something to build on, right? It's just set a lofty goal for yourself. Okay, um, so what's the solution to this? With modern switches, we've got a solution. Um, we have two different options, okay? And I'll just create a new picture for this. Okay, we have two options. Here's our distribution switch. We, first of all, could deploy what we call a chassis switch. These chassis switches are pretty interesting. Cisco has, well, they're called, everybody calls it the workhorse of the industry. They have these 6,500 switches for years and years. Um, they also have the 4,500 switches. Those are still around, by the way. The 6,500s have been replaced by the 6,800s. And, oops, a little less. And kind of both of these have been replaced now by the Cisco Catalyst 9400s. But either way, it's a chassis based switch. What's a chassis based switch? Um, a chassis switch is when we have, I think of the best way to describe this. We have what we call supervisor line cards. This is a modular chassis. Let me start, let me start with that. I'll come back to the supervisors. It's a modular chassis and I can slide line cards of connectivity into these slots. So it's just like any, like think of like a Cisco router. If you've ever seen a Cisco router where it's got um, empty slots on it. In fact, like old Cisco routers, if you've ever seen an old Cisco router that still has that sticker on top, it's like fill these slots with functionality as if they were selling it to somebody at, uh, you know, who stopped in at Best Buy or something. Like you can fill these slots with connectivity. Oh, thanks Cisco. That's why I spent, you know, $5,000 on this router instead of the $100 one at, Be at Best Buy. Um, so we can fill these slots with connectivity. And the way we do that is, well, let's, say a, um, let's say this is a 4506. So that six means there's one, two, three, four, five, six slots. Now, one interesting thing is that we have, this is where I have to come back to, we have to put at least one supervisor or soup in there. This is the brains of the switch. Okay, when we talk about a what we call fixed config switch, which is just a switch that isn't modular, it's got all of its ports hardwired in. Um, the uh, the ports, wait, oh yeah, the the brains of the switch are on the motherboard of the switch. <laughs> so we we have yes the front facing ports, but it's all one unit. We don't even think about that. But with a chassis switch, I can number one, I can populate whatever type of line cards that are available to me, but the supervisor is the, again, call it the brains of the switch. Now the 4506, I picked a model that I happen to know doesn't support two supervisors, but like the 4507, for example, adds an extra slot. Say, well, why does Cisco have a 4506 and a 4507? Seems like I shouldn't have to have both on the market. Well, there's a key difference. It's one support, supports dual supervisors for redundancy in case one of the supervisors dies and 4506 is single soup. Either way, with this model, we get five line cards. Now, given the scenario I just gave, what kind of line cards do we need? Well, in this case, we need 48 port line cards. So these would be the you know RJ45s. And that's going to give me connectivity to all my PCs and printers and everything. All right. So I've gotten myself all of this connectivity and um, so everything is good. Now we have to connect to it. And here's the cool thing. This chassis switch, even though it's modular, even though I've, I can populate with whatever I want, this is a single switch, which means if my distribution is a single switch, I can connect up and I can do exactly what we just talked about where I can bundle this connection. 
So ether channel, port channels are a way to fix ethernet, which is good. And chassis switches allow us to, um, to, to use, to take advantage of that. I don't have to individually cable between my five switches like I did in the previous example. So I'm not relying on spanning tree. Spanning tree is gone. And the hop count issue is gone because yeah, if I come in on one line card, I'm gonna have to go to the other line card, but that's fine because this chassis is super fast on the back plane. It's just gonna switch it right over and get it out the other line card. So um, it's a single hop no matter what. I don't have anything blocked. It's probably about the same cost as those five switches, maybe a little bit more, but hopefully it doesn't break the bank. So that is the idea of a chassis switch. Now, why would I, well, yeah, okay. So let me just leave it at that. Any questions on chassis switches, um, ask. I'm gonna come back to them in a moment, but I wanna talk about our other option. Um, chassis switches have been around for a long time. However, we have something that is somewhat newer that is worth exploring. And that is called stackable switches. Now, I say that. Stackable switches have also been around a long time. I believe they came out in, I know I entered the industry in 2005, and I want to say 3750s had just come out, which were the first, Cisco's first stacking switches at least. And so I believe they've been around for almost 15 years, if not 15 years. They probably came out in 2004 timeframe. But what Cisco has done and a lot of the rest of the industry has done is they've taken this concept of a stacking switch, which used to be reserved for core switches, and they've put them into the lowest level switches available. So Cisco has these 2960 line of switches and the 2960s were really low and really cheap. And then they came out with the 2960 S line that S stood for stacking. And then that S line lasted like two years and they quickly replaced that with one of their best switches of all times, uh, all time, the 2960X. So it was a phenomenal, phenomenal switch. Um, which has now actually been replaced by the Catalyst 9K line. So, eh, you know, is what it is. Those 90, I think 9200s are the ones that replaced the 2960X. I don't know if they, if the 2960Xs have been formally replaced at this point, but either way, the concept is this. I no longer have a chassis. I no longer have supervisors. I simply purchase a switch and then I purchase a second switch and I purchase a third switch. And these have backend cables, really high throughput backend cables. So these are usually like 20 gig or 40 gig connections, but I mean, pretty, pretty uh, fast. And I stack these five switches. Every time I stack them, I add another cable. And then there's of course, because we're networking, uh, we know the value of redundancy. And so there's a loop on the back end of these switches. But this is not running spanning tree. This is not running normal ethernet. This is running um, internal communications, basically, for fast switching traffic between the switches as needed. Because these are stacked, they operate as a single logical switch. And I can do the exact same thing. I cable up to two different switches. Doesn't matter which ones and I can bundle that together. I have eliminated spanning tree. I am leveraging port channeling. It's a single hop solution again, no matter which switch I'm on, because again, the hops back here basically don't count. They're, they're super fast, super low latency. Um, you know, we're not, we're not having to compete with other traffic on this, on the back plane. Um, so now the big question, we've got two different models we talked about. We've got chassis switches, and we've got stackable switches. So which is the right one for the job? And of course, the answer is it depends because if it was anything other than it depends, it would be extremely disappointing and the conversation would be over and we could call Cisco up and tell them you can get rid of one of those lines of switches. Clearly they have both chassis and stacking switches. So there must be a value in both and it does depend on the situation. So I will say this, um, you can always run the numbers. You can always ask Cisco if you're in the middle of designing this or purchasing it. Say, hey, Cisco, you know, give me a quote for that five line card chassis. Give me a quote for five of these switches stacked together. And you can run the number and see which one's cheaper. The chassis usually um, comes in a little bit more expensive up front 
but be, and because you have to buy the chassis itself, you have to buy the supervisor and potentially two supervisors. So that's always a concern. However, um, the line cards are cheaper than the switches because there's less to them. And so if you fill out a chassis, it gets cheaper the more line cards you use. If you buy a chassis and put one line card in there, it's gonna be a very expensive line card because again, you have to buy the chassis, you have to buy the power supplies, you have to buy the supervisors. So, um, you know, understanding that the more you fill out a chassis, the more cost efficient it is. Um, the other thing is this, chassis um, are, can be a little bit scary because in our scenario, I used a 4506 or 4507. Well, I needed five line cards and I used all five line cards to start with. Um, and so because I used all five of them, if I need a sixth line card, if I pull a couple more connections, there's an office remodel and we have 40 more connections that are gonna get pulled over there. Say, well, I don't have enough for that. I'm gonna have to add another switch. Ooh, well, my, my chassis switch is full. What am I gonna do? And that can be a rough situation. So we have to be careful with chassis switches. Um, one, so, so that would be a downside to that. What's an upside to chassis switch? One of the biggest upsides is managing them. Managing a chassis switch is a lot easier, like from a firmware perspective, because even though these five switches here are stacked together, each one is running its own version of iOS. And you, uh, Cisco's gotten better at these rolling upgrades to upgrade them all and such. But um, at the end of the day, you're, you're dealing with five different switches that could possibly think they're in charge, especially during a maintenance upgrade. And so it can be a little bit hard to manage these given certain situations. Um, and again, they can it can be more expensive than a chassis switch. So it just depends on the configuration of how everything is. Um, the chassis switch could be more flexible from the perspective of a chassis switch could have like 100 meg fiber ports, which are kind of an odd requirement. But if you've got the need for that, you might find that on a chassis switch, whereas you wouldn't on a on a standard fixed config switch. So again, this is where it just does, it does depend. But we do need to understand that, let me see here. So I talk about Cisco is expecting us, if we're gonna take the CCNA, to be able to describe the benefits of switch stacking and chassis aggregation. So the key points here is that regardless of the solution, I can port channel these links together, I can eliminate spanning tree, and I can reduce hop count. And as long as I understand those concepts, then for the most part, I'm going to be good. I've never seen a Cisco question say, given this scenario, should you purchase a chassis switch or a stacking switch set? Not saying you couldn't see that, but for the most part, there isn't a right answer there. And so they can't really ask that question on an exam. This is more something that we would need to consider in real life. I mentioned earlier that this is a real lifey type of topic. And that's why, is because in real life, I might have a closet and I might have to figure out what I'm going to deploy, and I need to take all of this into account. All right. So, any questions on this? Don't really see any. So I'm going to go on to the next topic. So we got about 20 more minutes that we're gonna roll here. Um, it's not too late, so a toss out there. I'm still looking up and down to make sure if you do have anything um, if anybody has any topics they want to cover, I'm more than happy to go down the path that um, is most useful. In the meantime, I will probably... All right, let's talk about the security because security is a topic that can be big and intimidating. And fortunately, this is neither of those things because they're only asking us for a few small things. And so if we can spend the last 20 minutes talking about this, then hopefully it'll give us kind of confidence that, you know, this isn't, this isn't too bad. So we'll start with 802.1x, DHCP snooping, non-default native VLAN. Okay. 802.1x sounds really fancy. <laughs> um, we know 802.1q maybe if we've heard of that, it's actually earlier in the exam topics. Um, up, well, it doesn't call it, it doesn't specifically call it out, but we're talking about inner switch connectivity and VLANs on a trunk. That would be examples of 802.1Q. Um, 
But this is, I already got off topic because it has nothing to do with Attitude 2.1x. It just sounds similar because they're both IEEE ratifications. So what is 802.1x? 802.1x comes back to this concept of authentication, authorization, and accounting. Um, it's it's triple A. So we talk about triple A, 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 A. We have authentication. I can't even abbreviate auth because authorization starts with auth as well. So authentication, authorization, and accounting. Okay. Auth these are general security practices that are focused on how do we basically secure our network from a number of different perspectives. Authentication is who are you? Okay, I've got to prove if I log in to my business's network, I've got to prove I'm Jeff Kish because I mean, there's a lot of different ways that we could go with that, but authentication is going to hopefully help me handle that. Authorization says what? What is Jeff Kish allowed to do? And accounting is kind of also what, um, but it's um, historical. What <laughs> did he do? Okay. So let's walk through these very briefly. Um, but this is, this is going to be an important concept for us to understand at the CCNA level. Authentication. <clears throat> we probably all have an idea of what authentication is. Excuse me for a second. All right. Authentication. Um, w w it could be a lot of different things, you know, um, first of all, the most obvious one for many is going to be password, username and password. I log in, my username is jkish or something along those lines. Uh, password is I love CCNA or I love Cisco or whatever horrible password I'm going to make up on the spot. And so the fact that I know my username and I know my password, which, you know, usernames aren't usually super secure, but passwords are supposed to be. I'm supposed to be the only person who knows my password. And so if a message comes in from across the internet and says, hey, I'm Jeff Kish and here's my password, then in theory, that, that's got to be Jeff, right? Because only Jeff knows his password. Now, we know that's a flawed assumption because Jeff could have written his password on a notepad, slapped it on a sticky note onto his monitor, and the entire office knows Jeff's password. Or, hey, maybe Jeff uses the same password on every single website he's ever on. And because some video game website got hacked and they all know that Jeff Kish's password on that website was I love Cisco. And so I'm going to try I love Cisco on his enterprise network. You know, that's an example of ways that other people can get my password. So if, again, think about it from the network's perspective, if if um, uh, packets come in, they don't see that it's me. They just see packets that have my password. At a basic level, we're going to use passwords to authenticate somebody and say, ah, you are Jeff. Now in the security world, not so much CCNA, but in the security world, this can get a whole lot more sophisticated. Um, for example, we see biometrics, um, you know, fingerprint scanners, facial recognition. I can log into Windows now just by popping my laptop up and looking at it. And it's like, oh, hey, I know it's you. Um, my laptop, my most recent laptop came with a fingerprint scanner. A lot of them have those, right? Just swipe your finger and hey, it's you. So these are all ways of proving that it's me logging in. Um, one thing might just be, hey, Jeff lives in middle of the United States. Um, why is Jeff logging in all of a sudden from Russia? Why is Jeff logging in from China? Why is Jeff logging in from Brazil? Right. I mean, the, these are more sophisticated security systems that can look at that and say, eh, something doesn't seem right about this. Um, whereas a, any other system would say, oh, OK, somebody's logging in from Europe uh, or, or Russia or wherever. And it says Jeff Kish and his password. Jeff must be in Europe. Of course, it doesn't actually think that, but it doesn't care. And it just logs me in. All right. Um, I'm going deeper than we need on the CCNA, but I want everybody to understand what, what's happening here. All right, authorization. Authorization is taking that to the next step and saying, okay, so now Jeff is logged into the network. What is Jeff allowed to do? All right, is Jeff allowed to access our core switches? Is Jeff allowed to log into our core switch and run show commands? Is Jeff allowed to log into our core switch and run configuration changes? All right, all of this can be set on the network. 
And so we can have junior engineers who are allowed to log into the core switch, are allowed to run show commands, are allowed to di run diagnostics, but they can't make configuration changes. And we can do that with what devices we're allowed to do. Junior engineers, yeah, you can access the even the core switch, fine, but you're not allowed to access the firewall. Only like these three people are allowed to access the firewall or what have you. And so we lock it down further. So that authorization concept is going to define what I'm, uh, me as a user, what I'm allowed to do. Right. Accounting is, again, just historical tracking. There's not much to say there. It's simply once I am logged in, is there a server that's monitoring and logging what I'm doing? So when Jeff takes down the network, maybe, hopefully, accidentally, <laughs> possibly maliciously, you know, if there's a user that's acting suspicious, it might be nice to know what they've been doing on the network. And so accounting is looking at that and saying, okay, well, they logged into the core switch and they started doing some, you know, commands. It looks like they're trying to, um, well, they're adding new usernames and passwords to the core switch. Why would they be doing that? Are they creating a back door? Um, they, you know, accounting would help us solve that problem. But it might also be more innocuous than that. It might just be, um, hey, Jeff, uh, the network went down. What did you do? Uh, I don't remember. I'm pretty sure I just said, you know, um, show run and it shut down. Well, Jeff, according to the log, you did a, um, you know, config T interface, whatever, shut down. Um, oh, right. I did do that. But that was just a non-important port. Uh, no, you shut down the core link. Oh, okay. My bad. So anyways, I don't know why I went into such detail on that story. That's totally, totally made up. That definitely didn't happen, right? <laughs> um, so that's the idea of accounting. Author authentication, authorization, and accounting. If we look in Cisco on Cisco devices, it's called AAA. And this is an industry-wide term. We all understand if we're saying AAA relative to Cisco networking or just networking in general, this is what we're talking about. .1x is where we're going with this conversation, believe it or not. So .1x is a way to, you know, everything I've just described is primarily from the perspective of accessing network devices, like logging into them and making configuration changes. But what if I just want to connect my laptop to the network and have network access? Okay, so that's that's good. That's well and good. Um, what if I want to take it a step further? What if I all of this concept of authentication authorization, that was really cool. I want to apply that to non-IT people and I want to make sure that they're allowed to access the internet or access my network or what have you. Um, I want them, based on who they are, I want to place them on certain VLANs. I want to make sure that they can't go anywhere but the internet or what have you. And so this is what .1x allows us to do. .1x gets put onto an interface and typically is going to reference a server somewhere that has a set of definitions. And these definitions are going to tell us what to do when somebody tries to log into the network. Now, the biggest barrier to .1x is that we have to get onto the PC here and we have to do config changes here. Specifically, we have to have a client that's running that can authenticate to the network who I am. So it might use my Windows credentials. It might say, hey, this is Jeff Kish logging into the network. Can I have access? And we check the definitions and we say, oh yeah, Jeff Kish, welcome back. Here you go. But because that's a manual process, we need an agent running um, on, on Windows to, to do that. And that can be a little bit of a pain. Uh, especially when you talk about having maybe hundreds of users. So because of that, um, you know, .1x doesn't get used a lot. But at the same time, it does get used a lot. It gets used by the companies that see the value in maintaining it. It's just, it's hard. There, there are ways to do it better. But just understand that it's not as simple like, hey, we're going to go deploy .1x tomorrow. That's what I'm trying to say. Like, definitely consider running .1x in your network, especially if you're a, a bank, a financial in, um, institution, or, you know, a place where you have to, you have to, you know, security is a top concern. Definitely consider running .1x. 
but understand it's going to take a lot of effort if you aren't running it today. Um, and because we're going to have to go to every single laptop in our environment and configure that, we're going to have to configure every single switch port in our environment um, because that's how we configure it. But you know, like I said, um, dot one X is capable of saying, okay, well, j based on the fact that you're Jeff Kish, um, I'm going to put you on VLAN 10 and VLAN 10 happens to only get access to the internet or what have you, or, Hey, because you're Jeff Kish, because you're an employee for this company, you're going to get put onto VLAN 15 and VLAN 15 is an internal VLAN. And what's nice about that is I could go to a conference room and hardwire in which I know is kind of an outdated concept, but hey, there's no wireless signal in this conference room. I'm going to hardwire in, and hey, because I'm Jeff Kish, I get access to internal stuff. Then my meeting's over, I pick up and I leave, and a guest comes in, and they sit down, and they plug in, and because they don't have a way of negotiating .1x or they're a different person than me, they're going to get put on the internet-only VLAN. So we have, it's a way of making login authentication kind of, you know, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but ubiquitous, transient, I don't know. Those these words aren't quite what I'm looking for, but it, it's pervasive. I think that's the word I was looking for. Um, it's pervasive, it's everywhere, and wherever I go, I can get my service, my level of service, that authentic, you know, that, that level of authorization. Is, can can be delivered to me no matter where I go. All right, so that's dot one X. Any questions there? Um, be sure to let us know. Let me know. Next on the list is DHCP snooping. Okay, so DHCP snooping is an interesting one, but it's 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 not going to take too long to under uh, to uh, to explain. I think it will pull up a new drawing for this. All right, here's DHCP snooping. Normal DHCP happens via broadcast. We know broadcasts go everywhere, right? <clears throat> so if I have a PC and I send a DHCP message that is a discover message saying, hey, I, uh, I need an IP address. Um, this goes over to a server and that server is going to respond with an offer, which sounds lovely. What happens if I'm a bad guy and I want to play a man in the middle attack and I want to say, I want, eh, I'm leaving you on a little too much here. I'll just say, it. what if I, as a bad guy, put my own DHCP server on the network? I found a conference room or I found a port in the hallway or in a, in a side room office, something like that. And I just plug in, it could be a little tiny, you know, Raspberry Pi, it could be an Arduino, it could be whatever, whatever little tiny computer I've got that's serving up DHCP messages. And so it's going to send an offer message as well. Whoa, okay, which one is the, is the PC going to get? Um, I mean, it might, it might get them both and then it's going to pick whichever one it wants. And uh, so, you know, there's a little bit of a 50-50 chance to this. However, also usually their DHCP server is like the real DHCP server is multiple hops away in the data center somewhere. And so if I plug in at the site, it's possible and likely that my messages will get there first. And so if my message gets there first, what am, like, why do I care? Why, why is this a problem? I'm handing out DHCP addresses. If I give you a bum address, you know, you don't get online, but at least I'm not stealing data. Well, it is a denial of service attack and it is taking users down and that's bad, but you're right in that sense that at least it's not stealing data. However, what's part of that offer message? Yes, there's an IP address in there, but the other component to a DHCP offer is the gateway address. So being the bad guy that I am, I also connect my own computer <clears throat> and I I legit get a DHCP address. Maybe I'm dot 100 from the, uh, from the real server. And I tell you the gateway is dot 100. And so then there's a router up here or a core switch and the actual gateway is dot one. And I know that by the way, because I used real DHCP. So I know the gateway is dot one. Because I just did this process, look what's gonna happen. 
this PC is going to send every single packet to my PC. And then my PC can take it. I can capture the packet, done. And then I can send a copy up to the router. <clears throat> and then return traffic will just come back down this way. So is the end user affected? I mean, on paper, on, on draw, whiteboard, chalkboard, whatever this is, Yes, I mean, that's affected, but does the user know? The user just went out to whatever website, done. The user just sent this information, done. Everything's working. The user has no idea that anything is wrong. And yet I'm capturing all of that user's data. This is, this is a way that bad guys can get a treasure trove of data in a very short amount of time. And we as network engineers should think maybe this isn't a, good thing. Maybe we should like prevent this somehow. This is what DHCP snooping is all about. <clears throat> so DHCP snooping, um, here. got four minutes. I want to respect everybody's time. So DHCP snooping says this, I create what I call a DHCP trusting domain. So I've got a DHCP trust configuration on that interface because I'm telling this switch, I know there's a DHCP server. You know, I had DHCP. I know there's a DHCP server out this interface. So trust any messages, any DHCP offers that come in. Meanwhile, I've got, let me make it red here for bad. I've got untrusted interfaces. I don't trust anything else other than my DHCP server. These are untrusted. So when my PC logs in, no worries. Yeah, I'm untrusted, but I'm not sending DHCP offers. But when the bad guy connects their little Raspberry Pi to the wall and starts sending DHCP messages to the switch, it's going to drop those like a rock and alert you to the fact that it's happening because hopefully we've got good logging set up. So this is a good thing in a network. However, everything comes at a cost. And the cost in this case isn't dollars, it's simply management of the network. I can tell you that managing DHCP trust in an environment can be a big pain. Only from the perspective of, okay, I just added a new switch down here and my PCs aren't getting an IP address. And everybody is scratching their head and scratching their head and working on this for a long time and we finally realize it's obvious with the color that I use to draw this switch. Oh, that, uh, you know what? I, um, yes, no, that is correct. It's not from this side because this side could be untrusted because it's sending it downstream. The question is, is that configured? Oh, I forgot to put trusted configuration on this uplink because it's an untrusted interface on that switch. DHCP isn't working. Um, the other thing that can really mess this up a little bit is virtualization, which is kind of an advanced conversation. But the longest short of that is I might have virtual servers. Let's say these blue servers are virtual servers. And now this server on the left is a virtual server as well. So now my DHCP server as a, as a VM lives here one day and then it migrates over here the next day. So I have to make sure that all of my connections to my virtual servers, anywhere that DHCP server could go, ends up getting trusted. So there is a little bit more to keeping this up and maintained over time. So just be aware of that. However, it is best practice, in my opinion, to deploy DHCP snooping to the network. All right, and as we wrap up with the last minute, non-default native VLAN. This one is a pretty quick conversation. Uh, it probably could be longer, but all of these all of these security solutions are designed primarily to solve a hole, a security hole in the network. And one of the one one bad thing about this concept of a native VLAN is I can really do some screwball things with native VLANs. Um, in fact, I can do some screwball things with non-native or, or yeah, yeah, with native VLANs, non-native VLANs. So if I, as a bad guy, start sending traffic with VLAN, ta VLAN tags that are not correct, 
I can actually start to see where the switches will pull those tags off and whatever I have written underneath gets forwarded on. And again, I don't have time to diagram this. However, understand this. If I'm using um, the native VLAN, if I'm using native VLAN in places, I can actually VLAN hop. So I could start on VLAN 100. And if I carefully craft a message, I could send it across this trunk that has a native VLAN configured and I could land on, let's say VLAN 10. Because this security hole exists, this isn't even like a protocol we have to enable. This isn't a huge best practice. Well, it is a huge best practice. It's not like there, it's like, oh, we're gonna deploy this like DHCP snooping. We simply have a recommendation to not use the native VLAN. So I've seen like VLAN 900 be pegged as the native VLAN and then we dis we disallow VLAN 900. Um, I've also seen VLAN 666 and other significant numbers that are like, stay away from this VLAN, right? We don't touch that VLAN. So whatever that is, I make, again, uh, because one of the downsides of one q is we have to have a native VLAN. So I make that native VLAN something I'm never gonna touch. Like again, maybe VLAN 999, and then I disallow it on that trunk. That is a best practice. The other thing to keep in mind is that every single Cisco switch, and pretty much to my knowledge, every single switch ever, comes with the default VLAN set to VLAN 1. So it's also recommended that we do not use VLAN 1 for anything because it's, it's as much as anything, it's trying to make sure that the bad guys know nothing about our network. And one of their first assumptions is going to be that everything's on VLAN 1. And even if not everything's on VLAN 1, if some of their things are on VLAN 1, then they're going to be able to take advantage of that. So that's, that's it. I mean, it was a quick conversation. I, I hurried through it. Long story short, don't use the native VLAN. Kill it on trunk links. Don't use VLAN 1 because that's the default native VLAN and it's the default VLAN for every single interface on any switch that you purchase and procure. Okay, Chief Tattooed Officer, I like that, CTO. Very rarely will you see DHCP snooping in a data center, however, I've only seen it used in a few places, 100% agree on no native VLAN if you're using VLANs at all. Yes, true. Um, number one, you have to be using VLANs in order to even have trunk links, um, but I do agree, yeah, DHCP snooping, Within the data center, yeah, hopefully your whole data center, so what, what you're saying, and I like that, is to say, you know what, because this is in my data center, like it's almost like a delineating, here's my data center switches, I'm not even running DHCP snooping here. Where I start to run DHCP snooping is over here. So my for like my core switch, or my distribution, That's I'll save distribution switch. So my distribution switch, I run DHCP snooping here, and I trust this interface, and then I don't trust anything else under here. And that way I don't have to worry about my VMs hopping around inside the data center if they go here or there, or whatever. I, I don't have to worry about it. And the philosophy there, the reason for that is in theory data centers are physically secure, more so than the rest of the world. And so the odds of a bad guy breaking into my data center, I mean, honestly, if a bad guy's in my data center, they can do a whole lot more damage and they can steal a whole lot more information <laughs> than simply connecting a Raspberry Pi to a switch. So. Um, ideally, you know, in most cases, it's gonna make our lives a whole lot easier if the data center is not part of that domain. That's a, that's a good point. Um, jump, jump straight to layer three networks as quickly as possible. So um, quick thought on that. Oh, you're talking about native VLANs. Yes, okay. Um, yeah, but you have to be careful because if you push layer three out to the edge, you have to be careful with wireless roaming. You have to be careful with um, broadcast-based applications. There are things you have to be careful of if you push layer three out. Uh, but you're right, if you do push layer three out to the edge, then you're not gonna have very many trunks at all and then you don't need to worry about it. So that's, it's not a bad, I've never been a big fan of the layer three everywhere, but that's kind of one of those chassis switches versus stackable switches. Layer three everywhere versus layer two to places. If you do layer two right, if you've got stackable switches and ether channels and everything like that, most of the advantage of layer three to the edge, you lose. You still get a couple of things like broadcast domains and um, just general clean network traffic, but you start to lose advantages of layer two. And so you have to decide whether it's worth the disadvantages of layer three to get the advantages of layer three. So 
but great thoughts. Great thoughts, CTO. Appreciate that. Um, all right. 9.35. Um, I'm looking for questions. I don't see any that have come in. So hopefully all this made sense. We were able to talk about a little bit of spanning tree at the start. We covered, oh my goodness, what did what all did we cover? We covered ether channels. We covered security domains. Um, so And we covered the stackable and the chassis switches. So that was a lot to cover. Um, but hey, you know what? This video is going to be recorded here on Twitch. So be sure to go back and review any of the sections that you may have had some trouble with. And as always, you know, if you study these topics this week, bring them back next week. Ask the question at the start. I'm more than happy to go in. I think everybody benefits from a good question um, to, to talk about something for an extra 10 minutes or so or what have you. Because um, usually if you have a question, you're not the only one. So bring your questions next time. Love the interactivity. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. And we'll see you next time.